Hello and welcome to the Rise Zone podcast. I'm your host, William Clausen. I had the opportunity to sit down with Greg Welfing, an agrologist with Anatus Bioprotection. We had a fascinating discussion about integrated pest management. We talked about the different strategies of pest management and did a deep dive into beneficials and biological controls. We also had the opportunity to sit down and talk about plant health, nutrition, and the role it plays in integrated pest management. And of course, we geeked out on the future of IPM, which included drones, artificial intelligence, and biotechnology. Here's my conversation with Greg. Hello, Greg. Hey, thanks well. Good. Thank you for joining us in studio today. Thanks for taking the time. Not a problem. So I have a question for you. Integrated pest management, that's what we're going to kind of talk about as an umbrella. What, what is integrated pest management versus just pest management? Sure. Um, I mean, the, the difference there is the word integrated, but it's... Uh, it, but is it a marketing term? No, it's definitely not a marketing term. It's uh, it's more of an approach. So um, it's using like a, a pitchfork approach or a coordinated method um, or a system of methods um, in order to control pests. So using multiple different strategies all at the same time in a coordinated fashion um, to control pests uh, and with actually a mind to protecting the environment at the same time. What do you mean by pitchfork? Like as in multiple? Yeah, multiple prongs, uh, multiple strategies going in, co- working in concert with each other. Okay. Um, to control pet. And is that like a new thing or is it like, because, uh, you know, I, I'm, I've part of the horticulture industry for a while, but just integrated pest management, has it never, what was, what was it like when it was not integrated? Sure. I mean, um, IPM as a concept has sort of been around since the eighties probably. Um, and that's really when it started to take off. Um, so that's when it was taught in universities. And then, so there's probably been one or two generations of, uh, or cultural workers that have been working with it. Um, but it's, yeah, it's a, it's a holistic systems approach instead of just dealing with things on a one-off basis or as a reactionary basis. So, yeah. And you, you're looking at how it interacts with other pests that may be there at the same time. Correct. Yeah. So you're, you're really looking at your whole operation as a whole. Um, and then zooming in when you have to zoom in on something, um, but then zooming out and looking at things from a different angle. So, um, if you really want to get into examples or specifics, like a a nursery, like quality tree, they're growing, you know, a hundred different species of plants, right. Um, and they're going to get 20 different species of pests that sort of attack those. And so you do have to have a coordinated approach when you're, um, when you're fighting those pests, because, you know, if you're doing, you know, thing, A for, you know, pest A, then that might affect, you know, plant B. So um, you really have to do things on a on a coordinated basis. So, yeah. So so what is your role in that? So you work for Anatus Bioprotection. Um, I, I presume that's the area you work is bioprotection. So what yeah. role would you do? Sure, yeah. Uh, first of all, I'll just go back just maybe a little bit and explain IPM. So like um, it has, uh, or there's four main strategies um, in the IPM toolbox. Um, the first one being uh, cultural control methods. Um, so that is, uh, like, for example, things that a grower can do to, um, change how a pest reacts in, in their growing system. So like, um, they can use things like temperature or humidity levels, um, uh, to control maybe what the pest is doing. Um, and then there's, um, there's another control method called mechanical control. Um, I mean, the easiest example of that would be like a weed, right? If a weed is a pest, then a mechanical control would just be pulling it out, right? Just physically removing it. Um, and then, um, and then there's another strategy called biological control and that's where I work in. Um, and then the fourth strategy is chemical control. So, um, but yeah, I work in uh, biological control and that's what Anatus does. So Anatus is a company uh, that's been around for 20 years. It's, uh, based in Montreal in Quebec. Uh, we rear, uh, 20 different species of beneficial insects and then also one beneficial fungus as well. Um, so my job with Anatus is as an IPM specialist or a pest management specialist, um, to go around to, uh, growers and different farms and different nurseries and advise them on their pest management strategies and how we as a company can help them in that. So, um, biological control is just one piece of an IPM strategy. Um, but it's, it's a big piece. It's probably the main piece. So, so if you're working for a company like, like Anatas, who is focusing on that biological, so you said there's cultural, which is the environmental cultural piece that the growers are doing. Mm-hmm. Then there's mechanical, which is literally taking the weed or, or taking the bug off the leaf. Manipulation. Yeah. 
Biological is using biological means, such as beneficials, other bugs. Correct, fungus. Uh, fun yeah, so... Like and, and then chemical is using sprays and stuff like that are chemically synthetic or... Synthetic natural. pesticides, yeah, or, or natural pesticides, yeah. Yeah, so bio biological control, we kind of split it into two different categories. So what we call um, microbiological control. So that's microorganisms, so things like bacteria, uh, bacteria, fungi, and uh, viruses. Um, that we can use to control different pests, and then also what we call macrobiological control, which is using uh, larger organisms okay. um, to control. And I'd love to dive into that sure. in a minute as yeah, well. Fair enough. I just but just back up a little bit in terms of, so if, if you're just focusing on the biological, how does it interact with all the other pieces? Because I imagine it's an integrated strategy. Yeah. But biologically, you're, you're integrating with other biological strategies, but how about chemicals? Like... It, do these chemicals not have uh, an, an ability to kill the beneficial biologicals? They, they definitely do. Yeah. So as part of my role, I have to be aware uh, when when I'm doing consultations with growers, those are questions I ask. Like, what are you using? You know, um, are you growing at this temperature? Are you growing at that temperature? I have to be aware of things that the grower is concerned about, um, even topics that that normally wouldn't come to top of mind. So like things like humidity, what's your humidity in your greenhouse running at? Like I have to be aware of those things in order to make the best decision on the biological approach. Yes. So all of those approaches affect each other for sure. And do do you as companies then kind of work together? Because you're not providing chemicals, I imagine. Uh, no, we we don't provide any synthetic chemicals. No. So we do strictly on the biological side. Um. Yeah. So like. Um. Yeah. Companies do tend to share information as much as you know possible. Yeah. 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 And that's other thing. So, so what's your role then? I, I believe you mentioned um, earlier to me you're in technical sales, I think that is. So yeah. what is that? Yeah, so like uh, the, the company obviously rears insects. So my job is to present those in insects or beneficials to growers as options for their biological control program. Um, when I see fits that, that could that could work in a, in a situation, then it's my job to recommend those for sure. Um, but my, my overall goal personally is to help the grower um, in the best way possible. So, yeah. So when you say you rear 20 species, for, what is a species I guess, yeah. of insects, what is that in the scope of insects that we are using in the industry today? Um, that, that's probably about half of the in, uh, insects. So there's about 40? There's right? about 40 or so commonly used uh, species uh, um, in biocontrol. Um, and those are like the, the macros that I'm talking about. So like living organisms, so things like mites and parasitoids and predators, um, all insects. Um, and then there's also the, the micro microbial ones as well. So, uh, we actually, we are one beneficial fungus okay. as well. And so I, I guess might as well dive right into that. Sure. So a fungus, is this fungus then affecting the way the, the pests are, are functioning? Yeah. So this, this particular one is a enzymopathogen. So it kills uh, certain insects. So, um, there's about four different insect uh, types or, or classes that we control with this fungus. So it's a it's um, the product is an actual spore. So we like spray the spore onto a plant, and then it, it lands on an insect, and then um, goes into the insect and kills it. So from the inside out. So. So, yeah. so, so some of your beneficials though are insects as well. Correct. Yeah. So those those dynamics are what we really have to watch and. Um, um, this particular product that I'm talking about, it uh, it doesn't really affect the bios all that much. There's one or two that it will, but yeah. So like all those bios kind of play with each other, and there's complicated food webs of who eats who, and um, but yeah, those are all things we have to think about when we're developing a, a management plan. So. so so as a technical salesperson, you're obviously in the business of of wanting to sell these biologicals. That but but you're also here as a, a you, you, I think you're an agrologist. You yep. said, yeah. yeah. So, so you're also here as the consultant that's then guiding us through. Correct. So it's basically Correct. one point of contact. Is Correct. Point. Yep. Yep. We we like to do it all. Um, uh, it 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 actually makes it easier for everyone when uh, when you have someone that's yeah selling the insects. I mean that's just numbers, you know, and and on paper. But uh, when you're um, when you have the technical background, yeah, you can you can do it pretty quickly. So, so is bringing a beneficial into a greenhouse or into a nursery very much like saying, I have too many rabbits, bring in the eagles? Is, is that kind of, is that, is that the approach or, or tell me? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So like it, it is sort of that concept. So it's using one uh, living organism. So we'll, we'll call them a beneficial insect to, to control another one. So like good bugs eating bad ones. Um, 
in in nursery settings and in greenhouses, a lot of times we get like aphids, which are pests that most people are familiar with, and spider mites, which is another pest that a lot of people are familiar with. Those things eat the plants, which is not you know economically beneficial to the to the grower, right? Um, so yeah, we're we're bringing in predators um, to those and to eat them, and uh, yeah, so the grower doesn't have to spray a, a chemical on them or lose their plants. So so what happens when the the bug the pest is gone? And, and you know the rabbits are gone. You have too many. You have too many eagles. <laughs> you have too now. many eagles. Um, I, I like that you phrase it that way. That's, that's actually kind of funny. Um, it it depends on which eagle you're using, I guess. So like um, some organisms can live for a fair amount of time without food, like a few weeks or a few months. And you mean this um, beneficial? Yeah, yeah, the the beneficials. Yeah, yeah. Um, some can only live a couple of days without food. So it really depends on which one you're using. So um, if they get no more food, then yes, they will die out. But um, that is sort of the the purpose of the the business is to bring in beneficials so you don't get your pest and then you know you can ship out your product. So um, yeah. and, and I imagine though, is there is there a detriment to the so this beneficial comes in has a large population of aphids. It destroys all the aphids or it eats all the aphids, whatever it does with them. Yeah. And now you've got an overpopulation of these beneficials. Possibly, um, is there a detriment to the crop at that point? Like, are they like I've got birds all over. I got eagles flying over my yard all the time. Now I'm clicking up, I'm picking up bird excrement everywhere. Is there? Usually not. So like, um, if that were to be the case, it probably wouldn't be a, like a choice for a, a commercial product. Okay. Right. So, um, such things exist. Um, but then they usually get weeded out over the years as, you know, not a very good economical option. So, um, the IPM industry or like beneficial insects industry has been around for about 40 years. So like, uh, those types of products just get weeded out pretty early on. So this is 40 years old, so in the... Yeah, okay. yeah, like uh, worldwide, I mean, it all kind of started in the, in the Netherlands, right? Um, and in sort of Northern Europe, the, that sort of area, um, cause that's where the greenhouses kind of started. Um, most of IPM started in the tomato greenhouses, actually. So um, years ago, like, you know, 50, 60 years ago, when they're growing tomatoes, tomatoes need to be pollinated by something. Um, they used to um, pollinate by hand, so either by paintbrush or with like a vibrating wand type of thing. Um, and then a lot of growers decided, you know what, this is not very labor efficient. So some of them played around with bumblebees and they released bumblebees in the greenhouse and they did all the pollination really well. Uh, but then they realized, hey, there's some chemicals and stuff we're spraying for other pests that are not beneficial to these bumblebees. So let's try to figure some something out. Um, and then so they started playing with different mites and, you know, uh, getting mites from various parts of the world and, you know, trying to control some of their other pests that way. So that's sort of how the industry got started and, you know, started with one or two beneficial mites and then uh, companies were like, okay, well, this is actually working. So they started mass, produ mass producing stuff and researching more and more things that they could control with beneficial insects. So that's that's where it is now. Absolutely. So, yeah. so it's interesting you bring up the bumblebees. Yeah. And and so let's talk about that for a minute. There's There's been a, a fair amount of negative press probably in that area, but also in the chemical control with, with things like Roundup and such. But um, is so this beneficial or biological control was really brought in to help with, you know, we're killing our bumblebees, we're spraying all these, I think, neonicotoids or whatever. Yeah, that, sure. Yeah. Right. That are killing the bumblebees. And now we're having a, a scare that possibly we don't have enough bees to pollinate the food sources in the world. And so is, so these beneficials are brought in to combat that. Is there a similar risk that we're now going to be damaging them by overpopulating, changing their ecosystems? Uh, Right now, no, I, I, I don't think so at all. I mean, I, I still think a lot of pollinators are still at threat from not just, you know, chemical pesticides, but from a lot of different things. Um, so honeybees, for example, um, I think it's, I think the stats are like a quarter of the food we eat are pollinated by honeybees, like worldwide. Yeah. Um, and honeybees are still experiencing a population decline. Um, most of that is probably due to like colony collapse disorder, which is like a whole big topic. Um, there's lots of different nuances to it, um, but chemical pesticides is one of the factors, but it's probably not the biggest one. So, so maybe while we're on that topic, can you shed some light on, on that? Because it gets a lot of press. Like, I'm not a beekeeper, so I don't know everything, but like, yeah, chemical pesticides is a factor that, that weakens bees or can kill bees, um, but there are others. So there are fungal and bacterial diseases that can get into hives. Um, there's actually a, um, a mite, it's called the Varroa mite, that actually attacks bees as well. So it gets into beehives and it, it actually latches onto bees and like sucks their blood type of thing. It's kind of like a little vampire mite. 
Um, yeah. So it's, it's colony collapse disorder is like a combination of all those things happening all at the same time. Um, we haven't solved that problem yet. So, um, no, so I don't think we're at a, a risk of honeybees exploding, you know, and, and, uh, mm -hmm. um, but are we at a risk of, of introducing other things that will be also attacking? Um, in, in this industry? No, I don't, I don't think so at all. Um, so all the, all the beneficials that we release, um, are usually quite specific to a uh, specific pest. So, um, for example, there's, there's a predatory mite that we have, it's called Persimilis. It's a little orange, tiny little mite, but the only thing it eats is spider mites. So like, it's not going to affect bees or anything like that. So, um, no, like, uh, the whole IPM industry is very conscious of ecological and environmental effects. That's like one of the core principles. So, um, if there were to be some sort of damaging mite or insect, it's, it's not going to make it through into any sort of control program that way. No. So some of these beneficials target like one specific correct pest. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, I can imagine the research that goes into that just to find that. So, so, so it's it's more or less different than the life ecosystems or the life cycles that we think of when we think of the larger order be, uh, beings mm -hmm. and such. Is it's just one specific? Yeah. So, like, I mean, in nature, everything has found its own little niche. So, um, you know, spider mites are everywhere, and so like this one, this one predatory mite has figured out. Oh, well, I can just eat just that and and survive just fine. So, um, there are other predatory insects that we use that eat multiple things, but, um, this one has found its niche and that's the only thing it eats. So, so, mm -hmm. so if, if these spider mice, like one, one thing I've always thought of, and maybe porticultures, agrologists and stuff know this answer, but maybe there's some of our listeners who don't is why are these pests so prevalent? And maybe the answer is a very easy answer, but why are the pests so prevalent in these nurseries and everywhere yet these, these trees or whatever we're growing are everywhere. And they're not, they're not getting, they're not dying from these same pests, but yet in the nursery, it seems to be this gargantuan problem. Um, there's a couple different reasons for that. I think, uh, one is, uh, we're doing things, um, in nurseries that aren't really, um, natural. So like, uh, we have large monocultural stands, right? So we're growing a uh, thousand trees instead of all of one species, instead of, um, and that then it Habit, has having biodiversity yeah so that that monoculture is is creating a, a pressure um for for the grower and then also um sometimes the the environment that we grow them in so in a greenhouse it's fantastic for spider mites for example so um yeah so the environment we're growing them in plus you know some of the cultural things that we're doing are just creating a boon for these pests as well and so so in in um say for example this spider mite spider mite and this as beneficial that eats that spider mite or, or, or attacks that spider mite is does it not come along with the environment when we're growing the plant in the first place or is it just because there's such a huge pest pressure that it just can't keep up that's that's exactly it so um so you're just trying to make it a fair playing field we're, we're trying to make it a, a fair playing field or even overwhelm so like in the biocontrol world overwhelming a pest is never never a bad idea so um that's actually usually the most uh, economically viable yeah. strategy yeah. um it's just completely overwhelm it, get it down to its lowest possible numbers um, before it can before it can flare up again. So um, yeah, part of my job is we're always watching these population dynamics. So um, pests usually reproduce faster than their than their predator, right? So like viruses. E exactly, right? So in general, we're always watching these po uh, population curves um, all the time. So so what do you do? Are you are you monitoring your pest pressures and then monitoring your beneficial pressures as well because i've even walked through a greenhouse the other day where i saw this little pot of grass on a pillar and like oh that's like a a place where our beneficials live so they have like a hotel to live yeah in or, I don't know. okay yeah so that's uh that's uh usually what we call like a banker plant a system banker plant a okay. banker plant system okay. so um there's a couple different reasons to have banker plant systems so um I can get into the into the nerdy details if you want, but um, let's go. Uh, sure, <laughs> sir. Um, there's one. Um, okay, so aphids are uh, like a major pest in greenhouses. Um, there are some aphids that feed uh, only on uh, monocot plants, so like grasses, and there are some aphids that feed on dicots, so like leafy leafy uh, plants. Um, and there are some that feed on both. Um, one of the pests that we get in greenhouses are uh, like the green peach aphid, for example, which feeds on multiple different things, so it can feed on grasses and dicots and uh, everything else. Um, we use a parasitoid wasp, um, which is a tiny little flying wasp and it's, uh, it lands on an aphid. It'll lay its egg inside the aphid and then the developing larvae will eat the aphid from the inside out. 
and that creates like those little mummies maybe that you've seen so like those little waxy paper mummies so um and then the new wasp will emerge from there and and repeat the life cycle yeah. but one thing we we use is banker plants um, we use it as an aphid control strategy and then we put a specific type of aphid on there um that only eats grasses um and then we we grow a grass in that pot we put that aphid on there but that parasitoid can also attack that aphid that's on uh, the grass um, and repeat its life cycle on that banker plant. So it's a constant cycling that's happening there. Um, and then those new parasitoids can go out into your crop and attack the aphids that are um, on your crop as well. Okay, so your banker plant is actually there to give the, the beneficial uh, a, a life source Correct. while it's defeated the pest population. Correct. But that pest population in that banker plant is not going to it's attack. You're not going to attack your your beneficial plants or the plants that you're trying to grow. So that is yeah. truly integrated. Yeah, it truly is an integrated approach. Um, that's that's sort of like the simple version of banker yeah, plant. There's um there's some more complicated ones. Um, there's another uh, predator that's called uh, Aureus. Um, it's a flying bug. Um, if you ever seen like a stink bug, they they kind of look like that except a bit smaller. But they eat uh, thrips, which is another major horticultural mm -hmm. pest. I've heard that word yeah, that <laughs> times. Yeah, they're, thrips is another pest. They, they suck juices out of plants. But anyways, so Aureus flies around and it eats those thrips. Um, but flying is a very like energetically costly thing to do for an insect. And so it needs a lot of nectar. Um, and so there's another plant that we grow. It's called alyssum, um, which contains a lot of nectar. And then we, so we just put those into a greenhouse and then the Aureus will feed on that that get their energy to get their energy to go control the pest so um that's using like a total integrated approach in order to to control your pest so, so you're not only bringing in the beneficiary you're giving them a place to stay a place to correct. Or get hungry or a place to have enough energy to go to go to battle and do what they need to do correct yeah that's pretty cool yeah so it's um yeah it, it takes a lot of thought it takes a lot of knowledge on you know your pest biology your host biology um and all, all of those things have to come up in conversation when you're developing a pest plan. Yeah. So, yeah. so there is a real effort. Uh, it was one of my questions earlier, but you've answered it with the banker plant, which I thought was slightly different than yeah. what you explained. So that's, that's awesome. okay. So yeah. there is a concerted effort to say, if we can not have this beneficial die off, but keep living and then come back when the population surges of the pest again, then that's a, that's a, a preferred method. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, that's, a, that's what we call like reservoir planting, um, type of thing. So. Um, it's, it's, it's a way to increase biodiversity, um, for that exact reason to keep your beneficials around. Um, that's actually sort of a, um, it's not a new topic, but it's, it's a topic that's, uh, seeing a resurgence in agriculture in general. So, um, even in like blueberry production or like outdoor strawberry production, um, actually even in the prairies in like potato production and stuff, we were actually seeing people planting reservoir strips of plants like marigolds and alyssum. Um, to attract beneficials so that the, um, so those beneficials will help control pests in their potato fields. Is that why my dad always planted marigolds around some of that? That's probably exactly why. So it's attracting things like hoverflies and lacewings, related bugs, to attack. which then attack all your pest insects. Yeah. So, so off, way off topic. Yeah. If you work for Anza's Biobotech, mm -hmm. which is a commercial company, obviously, mm -hmm. it's not a not-for-profit org. No. How, how does that help you commercially? If you're saying, well, I'm not going to sell you beneficials, you just keep reproducing your own. Is, is there... Um, yeah, but th that's fine with us. Like, we're totally fine with that. Um, that's a good answer. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's totally fine with us. I mean, uh, everyone that works for a company is like a biologist or an environmentalist. So it's about that. So that. It's not really about, about that. that. It's not about selling products. I don't think we'll ever get to the stage where um, human beings will, <laughs> will have like managed the environment so much that we'll never need beneficial we're not, that good. we're not that good. The trend is sort of the other way around. So, um, that's kind of why we exist. <laughs> I don't think we'll ever get to that point. So I'm not too worried about that. Yeah, yeah, good point. Uh, I wish we would get to that point, but, uh, no, we won't. so, so speaking of costs, I guess that was a segue. Sure. That area is. What's the difference between this and chemical? Like, is there a benefit for me as an owner saying, well, it's going to cost me $3 a plant versus $1.22 or whatever it is mm -hmm. if I'm if I'm using a, a beneficial over a, a spray that I can, all those sprays can't be cheap either. Yeah, exactly. So um, the just in general, the economic discussion is always there. It's it's actually a piece of the puzzle is uh, um, when I'm talking with growers about implementing a, a biological program, cost is always there. Um, practicality is always there. So like those questions are always around. Um, but in general, um, if you like, if you do a proper IPM program, um, it will 
cost you less in the in the long run versus like you not have remaining to... biological or you mean not having no it at all. no like yeah exactly like not having an ipm no. program at all so like chemicals are part of the ipm program it's sort of like the last thing on the list so we actually do um priority ranking right so like cultural and um uh, what I said, like mechanical uh, controls, those are the first two priorities in terms of uh, implementing an IPM program. Um, and then the third uh, level is biological control, and then the fourth level is chemical control. So it still has its place. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so it, it, and in terms of obviously bio to, prior to biological, chemical was higher in the yep. yep. ranking list. Mm -hmm. um, is there a, a major cost difference between biological and chemical? Uh, really not. No, I mean, uh, depending on what you're growing and and what the the crop is, um, in high value crops, no, it's there, there's really no difference. Um, biological programs will actually cost you less in the in the long run versus a, a strictly chemical program, um, because with chemicals, a lot of times you're you're killing everything, right? Um, good and bad, and so when you're when you're killing everything. Um, it's a lot easier for the bad ones to flare up again, and so you're constantly on what we call this chemical treadmill. So um, when you when you have a base level of biological control agents in in a growing situation, um, then you don't get near these bad flare ups, and you don't have to spray as often. So it ends up being cheaper in the long run. So so tell me about you rear these these insects. Mm -hmm. Is this very much like rearing crickets for you know snake owners or 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 <laughs> raising chickens or like what what is how, yeah, do you have the massive facilities that are that are rearing insects? You don't need massive facilities. No, um, you could do it in in sheds and barns and stuff too. Um, each one is a little bit different though, so like it's it's kind of hard to explain. But um, some beneficials uh, in order to rear them, you actually need to do uh, to like grow a, a plant and grow the pest and so like that um, uh, predator mite for spider mites I was talking about. We actually need to grow like tobacco plants and then we put. Um, spider mites on there and then we put the beneficial mite on there let it do its thing and then we harvest those beneficial mites so um and why specifically that plant um just because it has very wide leaves and it's very uh you got lots of yeah uh, lots of surface area yeah yeah that's why okay yeah so it's surface area and they are attracted to that they're attracted to it they eat it they do well on it both species do well on it so yeah all of those things are, are factored yeah. Yeah, absolutely yeah. and it, oh where do you where do you do that in canada um, so like our facilities in Montreal uh -huh. or just outside of Montreal. Mm -hmm. Um, and then we also have an R and D lab in Montreal as well. Okay. So that's where most of it. So, and then you yeah. ship them out here. When... We ship them all out, all across Canada, just via couriers. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Um, in North America, there's not that many, uh, companies that do what we do. Um, it's only a handful, probably about five, five or six. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So, um, another, is there a connection between IPM and plant nutrition? So oh, plant yeah. nutrition being the health of the plant, and yes, there's a there's a, a connection, obviously, of less bugs is a healthier plant. Mm -hmm. But what about I'm giving this plant nutrition, fertilizers? Does that play a role in in IPM? And and do, do some insect, do some bugs come when there are certain nutrients in the soil better than others? And absolutely, yes. Um, I suspect you know the answer to this already. I, I would imagine the answer is yes, but maybe yeah. elaborate on. It. Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. So one of the mechanisms that we see. Is um, when you're when you're growing plants, you want them to grow faster, right? And because uh, that leads to higher turnover and more money. Um, one of the ways to do that is using nitrogen-based fertilizers. Um, nitrogen actually has been shown over the years to, you know, increase uh, leafy growth, right? Um, but one of the things that happens is when a plant is growing too fast, it, its cells become like weaker, basically, um, and you get a lot like. You get weaker cell walls, which makes it easier for a pest to attack. It's it. growing too fast. It's growing too fast. It doesn't have a hardening cycle. And all. Correct. Yeah. Correct. So um, one of those pests that I was talking about, like spider mites, for example, um, they really like it when you pump the nitrogen in a in a plant because <laughs> they feed off of it too. So um, that is, that's definitely a link. So um, the faster you're pushing your plants, the weaker they're going to get. Um, plants also exude like hormones and pheromones and stuff. Um, a lot of pest insects can pick up on those. So like, say for example, there's a root disease that's affecting a plant. Um, that plant is weaker overall because it's fighting off this disease. A lot of pest insects can pick up on that and they can- Releasing different- fruit. It's releasing different pheromones and hormones and things. And pests can pick up on that and target that one specifically so that they they won't get fucked. It's kind of like a dog saying, that's the fearful guy. I'm 
that's the weak one. Yeah, I'm going to go after this one. Yeah, exactly. So, and, and apparently, a research study that someone, I think uh, it was Steph here at Poultry, that shared that about in Tel Aviv, they now learned that plants can even make noises at, at, at very high frequencies. Yes. So, very similar. They're releasing these pheromones as a result of the stress they're doing. Yeah, exactly. So, um, a lot of that stuff we as humans don't pick up on, but the, in, the insect world, it's. There's a lot of information out there that we're not picking up on, but absolutely. they they absolutely do. So yeah, just back to the nitrogen thing. I don't think yeah, I, I really explained absolutely. it very well, but yeah, the more nitrogen you pump, the faster your plant's going to grow. But the weaker it's going to be, and the insects are going to pick up on that and and, yeah. and maybe target that one. So that's definitely a thing. So I've I've in the past have um, recommended to growers to like scale down the fertilizer just a little bit, just so that you you give your plants a, a fighting chance. So. So, so a, a plant growing in its natural way, which I guess could answer part of my question earlier as well, is when I'm growing a hedge at home, mm -hmm. it's growing in its natural environment. I'm not pouring on the nutrients like someone who wants to grow it in two years. Correct. Um, so the, hence I may be building, I may actually be growing a, a bit of a stronger plant, which could be slightly more resistant to these spider mites. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, a lot of times in horticulture and agriculture, we're doing things that aren't necessarily natural um we're doing things against its natural way of wanting to be just because that's what we want so um yeah absolutely i remember years ago my my father-in-law used to grow acres and acres of trees and we'd literally go around with these white lids and try to find the spider mites mm -hmm. knock them off and mm -hmm. but yet my hedge at home never had those on it so uh, that was why i had asked that question but, like that and and that's probably the link right there it's yeah you know, it, he's just pushing that plant as hard as it can go and that's attracting the pest Dragon me fast because yeah. it's not quite as, as and I guess that's why any animal where we're yeah. pumping in the hormones or whatever the fertilizers the nutrients exactly a weaker exactly I mean yeah. yeah you see it in even in hydro organisms like chickens and stuff too if you're pumping hormones then you know they get weaker and yeah and they get other problems so so the so how you're growing the plant yes you want to push for speed and excellence because of cost and all those things because the economy is obviously plays a factor however there's a large impact is what I'm hearing on the pests you may be attracting or, or the things you may be doing. Yeah. And that's all part of the, the cultural management side of things. So like, those are all conversations that you have with growers. Um, and yeah. yeah. So, so, and, and like you said, you have those conversations where you do say, you know, you may need to just back off on this fertilizer versus that one. Mm -hmm. And, and, um, so does that sometimes require a, a huge team of people I can imagine because you got to be a biologist horticulturist agrologist all of it to get you have to have a wide range of experience in order to to do this job so um yeah you have to have seen things you have to have been uh, around the block a little bit I guess you can say um but then yeah you also have to talk with the growers who are here every day and you have to have those conversations all the time Absolutely. So you talked about, you know, the, the chemical, obviously early 1900s already, we had companies like Dow Chemical who were building or who were already building or making chemicals to spray. Mm -hmm. Then the biological piece came in and now we're talking fungi and, and things like that. What, <clears throat> what, what, where, where do you see future technology as such? Cause now we're talking, you know, I'll use the word GPT, uh, we're sure. talking all kinds of things. So let's go into that. And of course, not just AI, but where where's the future of this and not better sprayers but obviously we're talking some of these pieces as well sure yeah absolutely so yeah like like you hit upon in the 60s and 70s there was sort of that what we call the chemical revolution in in the agriculture industry where um every company was coming up with new chemistry and that's what was uh going on in the field uh right now we're in the midst of the biological revolution right so um we're coming up with a lot of new beneficial um uh pest control species so yeah, whether that be like a, a mite or whether that's a fungus or a bacteria. So like it's, it's a big boon right now in this industry. Um, it's, there's new products coming out every other month. Um, um, yeah. And then he, he also mentioned on the technology side. So in the next five, six years, there's going to be a lot of developments. Um, one of the areas I see is uh, drone technology, uh, which is a, a big thing. So, um, that's actually gonna like reduce uh, dependence on tractors and, and other field equipment. So, um, right now drones are able to, uh, like do spraying out in, in fields, especially, you know, like open fields. So, you know, things like blueberries or strawberries, drones are able to, to go spray things. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of legislation around all that, that has to change, but, um, in the next three, four years, that'll probably be settled out. So we're going to see a lot of drone spraying happening in the next little bit. 
Um, and that can be really localized then and really you can, so you can be more economical as well. Cause you're like, you got a hot spot, you don't have to pull out your tractor for that Correct. multi and just go take care of that. Correct. Yeah. And then, um, we're actually releasing biologicals via drone already. So, um, like releasing beneficial, beneficial insects like sex via drone already. So what, what's the benefit there of doing it? Sure. Okay. Yeah. Um, how else would you release them? Um, by hand. Okay. So, um, for example, in Quebec, there's a, there's a caterpillar that attacks corn. It's called the European corn borer. Um, it bores into the corn stalk and makes the plant fall over because it eats it from the inside. Um, we actually have another one of those tiny little parasitoid wasps that uh, flies around and it, um, it lays its egg inside the egg of a caterpillar and eats the egg of the caterpillar. Um, but we actually put those parasitoids in a little capsule and then we can put those in a drone and we can fly over a cornfield and we can drop all these little biodegradable capsules in the, in the cornfield. Efficiency scale. It's, it's an efficiency scale. Yeah. Instead of doing that by hand, which would be, uh, incredibly inefficient. Um, and also driving through a cornfield, you're going to wreck half your crop. So, um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. So, so you're, you're delivering those biologicals by drones. And so mm-hmm. the, the, so the application of what we're already doing is just going to get more efficient. It's going to get you're far more efficient. I mean, labor is a big topic in this industry. So anything to reduce, um, dependence on manual labor. Um, yeah. And I had another, oh yeah. in drones, um, there's actually a company in Europe that's using drones actually inside of greenhouses. So they're actually a very small little drone. I don't know, maybe about the size of your hand or so. Um, and they have a series of these um, tied to sensors in a greenhouse, and the sensors can pick up whenever there's a moth flying in the greenhouse, and it it, it knows what is flying in there because it, it's been trained by AI to recognize um, moth flights, and as soon as it detects a moth, it dispatches a drone from a little platform, and the drone goes there and just basically buzzes through the moth and kills it, and then it goes back to its its platform. So oh, laser beams. No, <laughs> no, but it is a little attack drone. It it just like buzzes right through the moth and kills it. So, um, but yeah, that's sort of a nice little. It comes back to get wiped clean and then go duty. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So. So 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 that that just prompts a little question. What about tiny little mic, micro drones that like the U.S. Army and stuff obviously have claimed they make that, that are the size of a fly? I, I mean, they, I have no experience with They can but, yeah. infiltrate the colonies, but is there, is there those kind of technologies? Uh, Not that I've experienced in, in this industry, but um, I mean, now that you mentioned it, I could probably think of a few applications where that, yeah. that could be useful, um, you know, like monitoring beehives and things like that. But um um, yeah, I, I'm very excited to see where that, that technology is going in the next few years. Um, you mentioned AI. I think, uh, the combination of drones and AI is going to be big. Um, AI is actually probably going to help a lot of researchers as well. Um, cause yeah, you can't forget like in the background, there's a lot of government and university researchers always doing, um, like basic scientific research, you know, on, um, temperatures and biological, uh, dependencies of, of certain species. So. AI is going to help them be able to like map certain species, map spreads. And, um, yeah. And so I think a lot of that basic biological research is, is going to have a big boon with, with AI. So making all of this research that's in the market right now, way more accessible and Absolutely. actually right alongside yeah, you. And so, faster. Yeah. And, and faster. You don't need to know about some cool research in some country where they've done it. The AI is going to bring that a lot closer. Yeah. It'll, it'll bring it to you and it'll also help them do it a lot faster so they can, um, like in the past 60 years, like a scientist could spend his entire career uh, really just mapping out one species. I mean, um, that has happened before, right? So, and combating one species, but with the benefits of AI, they can, you know, simulate things a lot faster and perhaps it'll speed up a lot of this research. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. So, so we're, we're seeing AI that's assisting thing. We're seeing big drones that are going to make applications and stuff more efficient. And then, so what do you call these, these little attack drones? Like, do they have a name or? Um, I mean, the, the company that's selling them, I could tell you the name. It's called PATS, uh, P-A-T-S. I don't know what that stands for. But is there a name of the technology or is it just no, called drone it's, technology? It's just a drone technology. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do you, do you see any future in where biology and technology are like, so I see an attack drone really just, yeah, okay, that's an attack drone, but it's not really biotech, if you will. No. Um, so is there, is there things happening in that area? Um, I mean, there, there are definitely things happening in that area. Um, there's a, there's a new technology coming out. It's a, it's a mix of biology and AI. So like in horticulture, we use, um, yellow sticky cards a lot. Um, yellow sticky cards attract insects and they get stuck. Um, and then we can monitor what kind of going on in the crop and what sort of flying insects are there. 
Um, there's a new AI tool coming out, and it's it's, it's been developed in the last few years. Um, but it can uh, basically just take a picture of that yellow staking card, scan it, um, and it it has been learned, or it has learned over hundreds of hours of being trained on AI what what each insect pest looks like when they're trapped on sticky cards, and it can identify, um, yeah, insects on sticky cards. So like you don't have to sit there manually counting it by hand anymore. Yeah. Um, yeah, so those sorts of efficiencies are coming. Technology, yeah. and then obviously, and as we mentioned before, you know, we're in the process of, of building and releasing a piece of software in the industry, so that that will help out with best management and all kinds of pieces, mm -hmm. um, running the whole horticulture business, basically. So these types of technologies that are then, like you said, this this uh, picture-taking software that then says, okay, you got 32 thrips, you have this many white flies, you have this much. That mm -hmm. information can all be fed into these other systems that then says, oh, you've hit a threshold, it's time to spray, send out a drone, do what they need to yep. do. And yep, absolutely. Or send out a beneficial or whatever it is. Yeah, so like uh, like a lot of large-scale greenhouses like this, they have IPM specialists on on staff whose job it is really just to to scout greenhouses and, and scout their growing nursery every day um, and know where the hotspots are, what's happening in the greenhouse. And that sort of software is going to make their life a lot easier. Um, there is some like really nice scouting software that's coming out onto the market as well. So like it's all GPS based and you can do it on your phone type of thing where a scout can be in the crop and just take pictures and it's all GPS based. But then it can also go um, relate to the administrative side of things. You know, you have to order so many bugs for this. You have to order this chemical. You have to um, do this next week type of thing. So um, yeah, those efficiencies are coming for sure. So is there any other things in terms of the future of IPM? Any thoughts you want to share? Yeah, sure. Um, there's a lot more biological species coming out. Um, I think every company has a few in the works. So um, every year there seems to be a new beneficial that kind of hitting the market. Um, the last two years we've had a couple. Um, but I think soil health is probably going to see the the biggest boon in the next few years. So Elaborate. Yeah, sure. So when you when you look at it like a cup of soil, there's probably more organisms in that one cup of soil than there are human beings on the planet. So, so if you go out in your garden and you take a cup of soil, there's over six billion type of uh, organisms in there. <laughs> so, um, as that seems uh, like an awful lot. It is an awful lot. So, like, there's a lot of bacteria, a lot of fungi. Um, like six billion different ones, or no, like of the same ones. Yeah, okay. Six yeah. billion in number, but it's right. probably a million different species of thing. Um, Science probably only knows about like ten thousand. So what are we doing in space? We can just go into the dirt, <laughs> right? Exactly. I know. We need a lot more scientists okay. studying the dirt than we do space. No, I'm kidding. Yeah, yeah. But you know, space is cool too. But uh, <laughs> but yeah. So like, there's a lot of informa information coming out there um, as to what's actually happening in those uh, in that space. Um, and of course, there's going to be a complex food web. You know, who's eating? Who's eating who? And we really have not even touched the tip of the iceberg when it comes to that. Um, there's a few different ones that have been identified in the last 10 years and those are starting to become commercialized. So like you'll see mixtures of a few different beneficial fungi coming out. Um, and that's, that sort of happened in the last two years. And I think we're going to see a very long continuance of that. So is that where you said you, you grow one fun fungus, I think yeah. you said, right? So, mm -hmm. um, and so this, uh, this evolution of all these fungi that we're identifying, you're you're seeing that as a real frontier where where like maybe that's there's there's answers in there there's a lot of answers in there to uh yeah maybe a lot of problems that we haven't actually even encountered yet so um and you're actually i mean if you really want to look at uh evidence of that um take a look at companies that historically were chemical manufacturers you know you mentioned the dows and the bayers and Monsanto's. they're actually buying up a lot of companies that are researching the biological side of things so um They've they've caught on to that and they're they're spending a lot of time. Future, yeah. Exactly, yeah. So they're spending a lot of time and money and effort into researching that stuff too. So um, that is the future in the in the near sense. Um, yeah. So so we're, we you speak, we talk about specifically soil health. So now we're getting into the whole area of these soil mixes are already being brought in. So now, it, so the true form of integrated pest management is only going to become more integrated. It's only become more complex. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and the more we know, the more we can manipulate. Right. So yeah. 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 And, yeah. and, and and control and make sure that we're providing the best plant and not and not destroying itself by doing things we don't know. Exactly. Right? So Wow. Um so so soil health and any other ideas around like so you already talked about the biotech or obviously yeah. the AI technology and all of that stuff. So uh so definitely just kind of in the biological revolution, if you will, but already there's other revolutions that are technology. 
yeah, that are starting to take shape. And yeah, I'm excited to see where they all land. Um, um, even the, yeah, the, the drone stuff, it's taken a while to develop, but it's, it's really starting to take off, uh, part of the month. So, and obviously we've talked a lot about going ornamentals and trees and stuff, but all of this stuff applies to food source as well. Yeah. Absolutely. And food scarcity yeah. is a big topic. So, so all of these things are, are beneficial in that area. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So the vast majority of customers we actually work with are food producers. And so, um, yeah, uh, here in Canada, uh, we grow like a lot of things in greenhouses. Um, so like tomatoes, uh, peppers, cucumbers, cool sorts of crops. Do you, do you see that? Um, and maybe this, because you, uh, cause you work in that area. I'm kind of curious. Do you see that there, there's been a lot of talk about GMO and all that stuff. And there's still people who are like, oh, I don't want that. And there's people like, what's wrong with it? So I imagine that would all of this stuff that we're working on also kind of allay some of those fears saying we may do we even need to be doing so much gmo if we're if we're if we only know two percent and ten percent of what what it's actually growing in yeah exactly um yeah I, I think gmo was like a super exciting technology in the in the 80s 90s yeah in the knots um i don't think it's going to be as popular as as that's kind of the sense i was getting that's what i want yeah so like i don't think it's going to be as popular um, in terms of the general sense, like, I don't think we're just going to, you know, start, uh, you know, uh, GMOing our apples again. I don't think that's going to happen, but I think it will happen in terms of, um, disease resistance and pest resistance in, in plants. So, um, if you're a company that grows peppers for seeds, right? Like you, you're selling pepper seeds to, to growers, you're going to want to make sure that those seeds and those plants are, are disease resistant to as many things as possible. So I think that's the direction things are going in. Um, it's not going to be the anti-browning apple anymore, but it's it's going to be like disease resistant. Um, historically, that's always been the purview of breeding programs, right? In order to breed resistance into a line of genetics. But um, there's there's new genetic tools out there. So um, yeah, like the, the the CRISPR technology, if you've ever heard of it. So I think that makes that research go a lot faster. Um, yeah, how are you? Yeah. What's CRISPR? Sorry. Yeah, I mean, I'm not a geneticist, but um, CRISPR is a tool that geneticists can use basically to like um, pull genes out of one thing and put it in, put it into another organism. So um, the analogy that that I've I've heard um, is that it's like opening a book and just pulling out one little letter and putting it somewhere else in a different book. It's it's very precise. It's a very precise tool. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. No, that, that's fascinating. So. Um, so you, you're seeing more of an emphasis on, yeah, GMO was cool. It was, you know, it was, it was awesome. It was exciting. Um, but it, let's not be focused on the convenience of what we're eating. Let's focus on the resi- ability for it to sustain itself. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, um, yeah. And historically in the past companies have used GMOs to like breed herbicide resistance into corn to make it easier to grow or, you know, um, to be able to withstand herbicides, but I don't think that sort of technology is going to last. Yeah. It's not going to stand the test of time, I don't think. Well, in essence, we were really just breeding something or trying to change the corn so that we could spray a chemical on it. Well, if we do not spraying the chemical anymore, exactly. then what's the gene for? Ex- exactly. So um, I think we're going to be a lot smarter with where we're, we're using these technologies. So, um, yeah. Wow. Well, um, Greg, you've absolutely blown my mind in terms of pest management versus integrated pest management. Okay. Uh, I was, I was, I'm delighted just to hear where it's going and, and you've almost convinced me to become an agrologist. <laughs> it's, it's super exciting. And, um, yeah, just thanks so much for feet coming out and talking about it. Yeah. Not a problem. Again. Yeah. I'm glad to get, uh, yeah, to have an uh, interest and I hope your listeners are interested in the topic as much as I am. So absolutely. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Not a problem. Thank you.